welcome. I'm Geeta Mohan and you're watching World Today. The big story coming in from Sri Lanka. Ranil Vikramasinghe, the Prime Minister, now sworn in as the acting president. A country in disarray, crippling economy and lost leadership. That is how the world is viewing Sri Lanka today. Amid financial crisis, the country is now staring at a major political crisis that could lead to the collapse of this once flourishing island nation. While China has left Sri Lanka high and dry, how long can other nations like India support a country that is yet to find a way towards stability? Is Sri Lanka a failing state or a failed state already? Or is there hope? Amidst a political deadlock, Gotabaya Rajapaksa's resignation came in on Thursday, paving the way for Prime Minister Ranil Vikrame Singhe to be sworn in as acting president. But the public remains unconvinced. Ranil Vikrame Singhe came to power saying he will solve the problems, but he hasn't done anything. Look at what's happening in Sri Lanka now. Not even women are spared. During election time, they came and embraced people and made all sorts of promises. But they don't deliver any of them. So there's no difference in Ranil or Gota. They have to go. While Gotabaya and his wife have fled Sri Lanka, former Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa and former Minister Basil Rajapaksa have given an undertaking through their lawyers that they will not leave the country until the fundamental rights petition filed against them are heard. Meanwhile, the parliament could hold vote on July 20th to elect a new president. Who are in the fray? There are three candidates who have made a pitch. Acting President Ranil Vikramasinghe, Dulas Daham Kumara Allaha Peruma is the nominee of the governing alliance. An MP from Matara district and information minister in the Mahinda Rajapaksa government. He's known to be close to the Rajapaksa family. Opposition leader Sajit Premadasa, who heads the SHB alliance. We have no problem with who the next elected president is. If it is Ranil Vikramasinghe again, the question will be if parliament is a place where views of the people are taken into consideration, it means that members do not understand the demand of the people for change and that the people are suffering. But the country is not seeking the people's mandate. It is the same parliament elected in the last elections who will be deciding the fate of the country for now. The ruling alliance has 103 MPs, including the Rajapaksas, as 43 MPs are now forming a breakaway faction of independent MPs. Sajid Premadasa of the SJB alliance has 53 MPs. If he can garner the support of the 43 breakaway MPs, 3 of the JVB and 10 of the Tamil National Alliance, then he stands a chance to become the next leader of the troubled nation. The parliamentary vote to elect the next president is going to be a secret ballot without a whip. There could be massive cross-voting. The ruling alliance continues to have the highest number, although they did not make the halfway mark of 113 in the House of 225. Meanwhile, the country continues to reel under tremendous economic stress, including Sri Lankan missions and embassies across the world. While India has acted as a good neighbor and important partner, China has been conspicuous by its absence. China is, of course, a very important creditor of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is clearly unable to repay that debt, and it's my hope that China will be willing to work with Sri Lanka to restructure the debt. The hope is not that just China or India or even the U.S., but the world and international financial institutions work with the all-party government that will be formed to pull Sri Lanka out of this huge economic mess. Bureau Report, India Today. Sri Lanka this whole week has been gripped by mass protests over its economic meltdown and tensions remained on edge till the news of President Rajapaksa's resignation came in. The commercial capital of Colombo witnessed a curfew with military tanks deployed on the roads. And while all of this was happening, India Today reporters were on the ground bringing all the action. And here's a glimpse of what happened during this whole week. You know, 
of the police is firing on the protesters. They were suddenly started marching towards the Prime Minister residence. Multiple tear shells and egg. You know, the shots in the air is being fired here in Colombo. Suddenly, I saw all the protesters walking. The moment they got to know that uh, uh, President has fled, now they're demanding Prime Minister to resign. This is the Prime Minister's office. They all started marching. There was a barricade. They're just trying to breach the barricade. Suddenly, they started firing tear shells. If you wish to know what a breach looks like, here are stand images. These were the barricades that were blocking the public at one point to the Prime Minister's office. But right now, all are gone. After nearly four hours of struggle over here, the public were coming row after row to face tear gases. Still did not budge. They have entered the Prime Minister's office now. The armed person here are still completely armed and they are waiting for their orders on one side while the public have entered the place and they are walking towards various locations as well. This kind of situation arose because earlier the Prime Minister, who was still the Prime Minister till morning, Ranil Vikramasinghe, was then made the acting president and this did not go well with the public who immediately decided to storm into the Prime Minister's office. Look at the other side. It's all <coughs> multiple tear shells. This is to disperse the crowd. Look at these amount of tear shells fired here in Colombo. Exactly what unfolded on uh, <coughs> July. Similar pictures we are seeing at Ground Zero here in Colombo. These protesters now covering their face. Because with the, you know, this is how they are preventing themselves from the smoke. After row, no matter how many times they had to face the uh, uh, tear gases here, they did not bust. They entered. Many fainted. Many things happened, but nobody did not move. Like thousands and thousands of people gathered in front, and they actually had now currently entered the prime minister's office. And we are at the prime minister's office lane. Still now, the chaos is continuing because of the one information that the Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe has been now appointed as the acting president. In fact, the situation escalated so much that Ranil Vikramasinghe had to go ahead and say that he would be only the acting president until 20th of July or so, until uh, an all-party government is formed, and that clarity will be provided. But for now, after several hours of struggle, the people of Sri Lanka, the protesters, have entered the Prime Minister's office on its lawn, along with the people who are still protesting against Gautabe Rajapakse and Ronald Vikram Singhe. For India Today, Pramod Madhav from Colombo. This is an India Today exclusive. Amid the crisis, we also spoke with Sri Lankan opposition leaders, such as Premadasa, who in coming days could be a very important and key figure in Sri Lankan politics. Listen in. This is an India Today exclusive. Even as Sri Lanka is on the brink of collapse and there is a fight for leadership, I'm being joined by opposition leader Sajid Premadasa, one of the men who've thrown his hat into the ring. Many thanks for joining us here on India Today, sir. My first question to you, what's the way forward? We've seen that uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa is yet to resign and uh, the movement forward in terms of an acting president has already happened. But what's the real process? Who then can be the acting president and where will the government or how will the government really be, be formed? So if you could just explain uh, what's the way forward in the procedure. Well, right now in Sri Lanka, you have extreme and absolute political gridlock. The request of the majority of the country is for both the president and the prime minister to resign and for a new all-party government to be set up on an interim basis. Constitutionally, when both the president and the prime minister resigns, it is the speaker who becomes the acting president. Mm. So, there is constitutional provision for both those people to resign and for the country to go ahead mm. with the constitutional processes which mm. will ultimately decide the destiny of the country. Mm. So uh, what you have right now is a virtual anarchy, an anarchical society in Sri Lanka. Anarchy is reigning. 
Well, this question must have been asked a lot in the past as well. Apart from all the reasons that you've given, China certainly is a factor. The Chinese debt trap that have been uh, that has been talked about oft. Uh, we know that China did invest a lot, did arm twist Sri Lanka in many ways than one, and now. Uh, they are nowhere to be seen when, when, when Sri Lanka is facing the worst crisis of all time. Well, basically, Sri Lanka should have a neutral external policy. We should work with all that adds value to the country. We should not marginalize China. We should not marginalize India. We should not marginalize Japan, US, the European Union. Russia and other countries. We should not marginalize the Middle Eastern countries just because they are Muslim. It happened before. So we should work with all. We should work with all for the betterment of our nation state. It's quite simple. Simply try to ascertain the national objectives and the national interests, properly define it articulate it in a coherent manner, establish the objectives and the tasks, and also the timelines, and devise the policies to achieve them, and ensure that there is a proper evaluation, management, and monitoring process of your policies. So our policies should be national interest oriented. Rajapaksas, now their whereabouts, they're not in Colombo. They have left uh, the country and left the city. Will they be really held accountable? What uh, do you make of how they have left the country or left the city? They, uh, their whereabouts not known. And the fact that they're not being held accountable, do you think should they be or will they be held accountable in the future? Look. To be very honest with you, um, we are concentrating on rebuilding Sri Lanka, rebuilding the economy, bringing back prosperity, bringing back the lost jobs, improve our employment figures, reduce inflation, uh, enhance growth, ensure that our uh, triple deficits, uh, the budget, trade, and balance of payments are in the green and not in the, in the red. Uh, so we have a lot of stuff to be concerned about. And as far as the whereabouts of the Rajapaksas, uh, I want to very humbly say without any arrogance, those are the least of my concerns. My greatest concern is for the 22 million people in Sri Lanka who are suffering, who are in hunger, who don't have a, a, a proper wage. Their livelihoods are destroyed. Now, after the Quad, the AUKUS, and the IPF, another new grouping has been formed that's called the West Asian Quad by many. Four-nation grouping, the I2U2, has established a positive agenda and its framework is a good model for practical cooperation in the face of increasing global uncertainties. With major thrust on food security and energy security, India, Israel, the U.S. and the U.A.E. have come together to ensure that situations like the Russia-Ukraine war or, for that matter, COVID-19 pandemic do not throw the world off gear. Now, while blocks after blocks are coming about to counter nations like Russia and China, delivery of goals have been slow-paced. The grouping was first mentioned in October last year by a senior U.S. official who said the meeting will take place during U.S. President Joe Biden's ongoing trip to the Middle East or what we call West Asia. The most critical features of this bloc is the food corridor and enhancing energy storage capability. An initiative like the food corridor between India and the UAE, which was put together by this group, is a clear example of a creative solution to a problem we are all, we're all facing. The fast transportation of food and preservation technologies, the ability to connect relative advantages together, this is the solution to the problem. The first two projects that we're tackling together on food security and clean energy are designed to take on two of the most urgent crises affecting people around the globe. Food insecurity. The UAE's investment 
to develop integrated agricultural parks across India with the support of the American and Israeli private sector experts has the potential to sustainably increase India's food yields in the region threefold in just five years. Now the four nations are looking at major investments including two billion dollars worth of investment by UAE in food parks across India and cooperation and innovation in agriculture sector. I2U2 framework के तहत हम जल, ऊर्जा, परिवहन, स्पेस, स्वास्थ्य और खाद्य सुरक्षा के छह महत्वपूर्ण क्षेत्रों में joint investment बढ़ाने के लिए सहमत हुए हैं. For the U.S., the agenda is clear. Israel's integration into the region, both through the Abraham Accords with the UAE, Morocco and Bahrain, and also an entirely new grouping of partners including Israel, India, UAE and the United States of America, what is now called the I2U2. Now let's have a look at what's happening from across the world and world at a glance. U.S. President Joe Biden embarked on his first Middle East tour to meet Israeli and Palestinian leaders. Biden restated support for two states for two people, but said time was not ripe for Israel-Palestine talks. The other focus of Biden's four-day trip was a visit to Saudi Arabia. Biden's Middle East tour is being seen as an effort to re-engage with America's long-time strategic partners in the Middle East. A major diplomatic win for the India in the U.S. The U.S. House of Representatives passed a legislative amendment that approves the waiver to India against Casta. What it means is that India won't attract sanctions if it buys weaponry from Russia. The legislative amendment was authored and introduced by Indian American Congressman Ro Khanna. The chances of an Indian origin man at 10 Downing Street have become brighter. After two rounds of voting for who will replace Johnson as leader of Conservatives, Rishi Sunak was well ahead in a race of five contenders. By July 21st, the race will be down to two people. The suspense is, will it be Penny Moda or Liz Truss? Italy is once again in the midst of a political crisis. Prime Minister Draghi has announced his plan to resign on Thursday. After the five-star movement, a coalition party declined to back him in a confidence vote over his plans to combat soaring prices. The Italian president has rejected Draghi's resignation, but the prime minister's position is far from comfortable. That's all we have in this edition of World Today. Stay tuned to India Today for all the latest news and updates.